following objects. Um, So here's the choices again. Which one would you like me to discuss? Mm -hmm. We got a uh, two is winning the lead here. All right, whether to invest in a project or not. So. Typically, an organization is going to make a change by having a team of people attack a specific problem. They'll call it a project. They'll give it some resources, like an office, some computers, you know, six months to get a product. So the question is, um, should we invest in that project? So this is my quick response to that, is basically that um, I like to figure out what the cost and benefits and the risk are associated with that. So what I typically think of for making a new project is I want to have uh, a product that's better than what we have now. Right? So that means um, understanding what we have and then maturing it, typically, um, not coming up from scratch. Uh, and then the reason that that's useful is because not only do you create something that's an improved product, but the people making the product also learn how to do that improvement. Right? So now that Let's say um, I'm trying to build a better backpack. So if I make the you know, six months of investment trying to figure out where to make this backpack better, right, there's a hole in the top, all, all this experience stuff, every time that I'm brainstorming and working with other people, I'm actually learning how to build a better product. And so that experience means that when I go back to my organization and work in the, my regular job, now I can say, oh, I referenced that back in my uh, time when I was working on that project. Right? So you're building your workforce's skill. That's a huge benefit. Cost, obviously you have um, the people who you're losing to that project, they're no longer working on their regular jobs. Right? And then I have to evaluate whether the opportunity of spending those people is worth it. And they may not succeed. So that would suck. Right? I spent six months of time, ten people, and now that project failed, so they just come back and work on their regular jobs with the experience, but we didn't get anything out of it. So if I don't invest in the project, I know what I'm doing. Right? I, I have a stable product. I don't lose any money for research. Right? And uh, there's a risk to that, right? If I don't invest in that project of like spending all these people on it, I may not innovate and the market will overtake me and I'll lose the company. Right? So there's some risk involved. So that's the sort of straightforward sort of things to think about, cost, benefits, and risk when I'm doing uh, the comparison. And then the next step after this is to figure out which of these things is quantifiable. Right? Like what are the odds of the people that I've included, are they going to fail or not? Right? What is the actual monetary cost I'm going to spend on this project? Um, you know, if I make this project and it does actually produce a product, what is the expected return on that investment? So every one of these aspects that we brainstormed, then we would quantify that, and then I'll just demonstrate how we would make that into a model. Question that cost, benefit, and risk for each of the options. And now it's going to be your turn. Yeah, right. So we're going to count off into groups of three, and then we'll. Uh, so each group will figure out the cost, benefits, and risk of the respective problem for their group. Right. So let's count off. We've got Travis as one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to have to have six. Six, one, one, two, four, three, or four, five, six, seven. Oh, sorry. One, two, three, four. All right. So now you'll get with the same uh, group, the number that is that you were assigned to the group up here. Right. So there'll be two groups working on each problem. Yeah. So 
one work. So let's see. I talked about two. So group one will work on problem one. Group two will work on problem three. Group three will work on four. We can just five works on one. Did I get that right? Yeah, four works on one. Five on three. Give you one more minute.
So the next phase of this activity is for you to find someone who didn't work on the project that you worked on and then talk to someone else on their about their problems. It's basically exchange about what the analysis you did and get feedback from them about your analysis. So now you're going to have to like split up in the groups that you didn't talk to. One of them. Okay, we got one more minute, then we'll come back. So my claim to you is that for each of the four problems that we worked on as a class, we could write a numeric model for that question. And I, I'm telling you that you can develop that model even though you don't have the exact specifications. Right? So I'm going to go over one model where basically I, as a data scientist, 
I know what the problem is, even though I don't know what the specifics are. And that allows me to make progress. I'll demonstrate what I mean by that. All right, so basically my, my tactic is, um, as I advocated, figure out, you know, do some brainstorming, cost benefits and risk of those, which ones are quantifiable, um, and then that's what we're going to build our model around. There's a bunch of caveats, right? Like, basically, you're making a forecast about what the business should do. It's probably going to be wrong. You're going to have to accept that, that you're not going to have perfect knowledge, right, all the time. And so being upfront and transparent with your customers about that is really important because you shouldn't sell them the idea that you're going to provide them the right answer. You're providing them a better decision than a guess. That's about all you can offer. <laughs> I mean, dumb. If you can do better than I guess, you're probably better than a lot of businesses who are just sort of flying by the seat of their pants, making decisions based on their experience, what they've heard from other people, and what they read in the newspaper, right? Like that's typically what people are making decisions based on. Sad to say, and not just small decisions. I'm not saying like, you know, should I buy, you know, white eggs or brown eggs at the grocery store? Like million dollar business decisions, right? Like, will the business succeed or fail? That scale of decision making. So, one thing that I've learned is that. Um, as people change the scale of their decision making, their decision making process typically doesn't change. So, so think about like the same way that I decide, you know, should I go to the gym or should I get a burger? That same calculus is being applied to decisions that will affect the outcome of a team of 10 people or a large scale corporation, right? That same thought process, because that's what the person making the decision has experience with. I'm hoping that you, have, having some training in data science, will be able to come in and offer them an alternative perspective. Right? They're not going to typically hire a dentist when they want to figure out whether they go to the gym or, or get a burger. Right? You could. That's a quantifiable decision, which has outcomes. Right? Quantifiable. But the scale of decision typically doesn't require having a data scientist. All right. So the problem I'm going to attack here is uh, the question of, should I hire additional staff or pay overtime? That's a that's a question that I who here had that one? I would one person. Two. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So there's a few of you who hopefully have talked about this specific problem. I'm not claiming that you came up with these specific factors. Maybe you came up with something similar, maybe you came up with something different. The consequence of that is your model is gonna look different than what I produce. Right? The assumptions I'm making are on the strength of the brainstorming session that I had for this specific problem. This isn't exhaustive, right? If we had all the variables, we're going to have a better model. If we had the right values for our parameters, we're going to have a better model. But again, this is just to get you started about the process. OK, so first we're going to look at an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, sorry, a, a Jupyter notebook. You can pull it up. All right, so this is like a little look into how Ben's brain works. Right? Uh, don't worry, I don't do anything important at work. So first off, I import matplotlib because I like visualizations. Two reasons. Typically, they're going to show up in the reports that I try to give people. The, the first reason, the most important reason, is that I want to understand how the data is behaving. And I can do that with a table, and I can do that with a little summary statistics. But a visualization, for my own purposes of debugging my model, is way better. OK, as I warned you, I'm going to make up a bunch of numeric values. These have nothing to do with reality. right? They're just placeholders. So that when I go talk to someone, I can tell them, these are the values I'm using. And they'll say, those are wrong. You should use this. And I'll use those. And I'll already have a working model. Right? Pretty straightforward. So I don't have to actually know what the values are. They'll have some significance on the outcome. But again, when you're using the fake data as input, you shouldn't rely on the output. In case somebody's doing that. All right. So for this model, I want to figure out whether I'm going to hire more workers or pay the existing workers over time. That means I'm probably going to know, need to know what is my hourly rate that I'm getting charged for the workers. How many hours do my uh, people typically work? We'll say eight hours. Um, and then to make my life easier, I'm going to have my workers producing widgets. Widgets are very, anybody here ever uh, used a widget? Come on. OK, you got one. That's good. So widgets are just like a placeholder idea of like a thing, whatever it is. Um, and so I'm claiming that. My trained workers can produce three widgets per hour. So I've done some quantification there, right? I haven't told you what the widgets are, but it's a thing. Um, and then some of my workers, they're being trained. 
And while the worker is being trained, they also produce widgets, but at a lower rate per hour, right? So one per hour because they're being trained. And then the training class takes five days, after which they will revert back to the, uh, the normal rate of production. And then I'm going to look at this investigation over the span of 30 days. The 30 days is sort of a scoping parameter, like how big of an investigation do I want? Right, the granularity here, by default, by the way I set up these parameters, um, is per day. So that's a choice that I've made, right? I could do it widgets per nanosecond, but that's not really something I care about. So again, this is sort of my intuition of what's the scale of relevance, right? Am I making decisions about whether to hire people on the scale of minutes? Or am I making decisions about how to hire someone on the scale of months to years, which is more typical from a hiring perspective? So those are sort of things that I've built into the model just by the choice of parameters I made. All right. And centuries is a little bit too long. So um, then I'm going to basically initialize a calendar right, of days. I'm going to go over 30 days. You can adjust this and play with it to your heart's content. And then I need some variables to store the output of my um, my guesses. So I'm gonna, these are the things I'm recording in it and initialized. Um, and you'll get back to see what those are in a little bit. But basically, um, I wanted to figure out, I'm, I'm having workers that are um, being paid, and I'm having workers that are being trained, and they're all producing widgets. So to get quickly to like, what is that code doing? It's basically saying like, how much do I have to pay people? I should scroll up a little bit more. And so the cost of uh, getting a new worker and having an existing worker oops, not that one, is the same. So, so this is like, so why did I visualize this number, right? It's because it's what I expect to happen. People who are getting paid are getting paid the same amount, and therefore, over the span of days, the money that I spent on those workers is the same. No surprise there. It validates that the model isn't wrong yet. All right, now the important question. I remember that the, the people getting trained, they're going to be producing widgets at a lower rate, right? One per hour, I think it was, versus three per hour. And so if I look at the cumulative number of widgets that I've produced over those 30 days, the new workers will eventually catch up, right? They'll have the same slope of widget production as the trained workers, but they'll never catch up. And so that's like another sort of obvious thing of the people who are starting with a deficit won't catch up to the people if they're all working at the same rate after training. So again, this is just me validating that my model isn't wrong yet. So we haven't actually got to the question of overtime pay yet. So yeah, the conclusion of this is you should never hire anyone new because the new people will never catch up with the old people for productivity. Okay. Okay, so, so <laughs> there are more important questions typically like the cost of widget production. So again, how many widgets am I producing? And then what is the cumulative cost of those widgets being produced? I can divide those two numbers. The trained workers, their cost of production per widget is constant. But there's a different sort of curve for the people who are being trained. Right? So when they're being trained, they're producing things at a low rate. And the cost of that is high because I'm paying them the same hourly wage. And so you get this, this interesting phenomenon where the cost per widget Sort of like asymptotically approaches the trained worker, but it will never ever reach the same cost. Which is again kind of a cool little aspect to think about. So the people who are your training, they will eventually be more productive, but the amortized cost of their training, it's always going to bite you. Again, nothing new here. I haven't got to the overtime part, but I'm just doing some exploration. Okay, so now I'm going to get into my overtime calculation. I want to say that the overtime uh, increase in pay rate, it's a buck, it's 125% of their normal pay. So I'm going to pay you an extra 25% for every hour you work, and you're going to produce widgets at the same rate. Um, and I'm going to have you work an extra three hours per day. So instead of eight hours, you'll be working 11 hours at that overtime rate. And everything else is basically held constant. Right? So the, the first thing I did was validate that my model as set up is uh, reasonable, and I'm going to introduce the new thing. And so basically, I go back and I do all the same calculations of how much money is spent on each worker, right, and all these other factors. Um, and so what we'd expect is that we'll get more widgets produced, but the question being asked is which one's more financially efficient? So we'll look at this crossover curve. 
All right, now this is where the fun is, right? Where are these cost of uh, these uh, these trade-offs actually relevant? And so, again, remember that we had a trained worker and a worker who is working overtime, so they're producing slightly more widgets, um, and they're being paid slightly more money. Um, and so the cost per widget, right, for that trained worker is this value. But then for the uh, new people, right, if I went with that model, they're not being paid as much, right, and their rate of production is lower. But in this case, for these this selection of parameters that I made, there is a crossover. So can anyone tell me what the consequence of that crossover is? Like, what, what as a business person should I be thinking when I see this plot? Right. So, so this this threshold right here, like about, about 20 days, that's where the decision about if I only need an increased widget production for the next 15 days, I should stick as a business owner. I should stick with the idea of paying my workers overtime, right? So that sort of short sprint activity of I need to increase increase widget production for 15 days. Totally stick with the, the existing workers. But if I think I'm going to produce widgets for a long time, right, at an increased rate, then it would be financially stupid to not hire new people. Right? So this is like a trade-off, like to see where is that, that crossing. And so if I need a sufficient number of work as, uh, widgets produced for a long time, then it's going to be cheaper to stick with the overtime pay for new, or sorry, the, the new workers rather than the overtime pay. So again, as a data scientist, this is a model that you could create then you'd get feedback from your customers saying, are these parameters correct, right? Maybe we want to run this evaluation longer at different, like, you know, exploration or analysis of alternatives, what it's typically called, to figure out um, what are the options. And then you can sort of explore with where does this crossing occur for different situations. Right. And all this is sort of intuitive from the business person's perspective, so it shouldn't be too hard. But your job as a data scientist will still need to interpret what this means, right? All they see is a bunch of black dots and green dots. And who knows what that means, right? So you'll still have to do the interpretation. Um, but it's a negotiation back and forth. Okay, I think, yeah. So this is another way of basically looking at the number of widgets produced over time, and the crossing there is not quite as visible. Yeah. So basically, go ahead. So claim for you guys is that you could do this for the other three problems that we discussed. Okay. Other questions? Okay, I think that's all for that section. Oh yeah, oh no. I mean, it's a good thing I reminders myself. All right. So this is you as data scientist from Excel making plots, right? That's cool. Just for grins, I wanted to sort of spin up the same model in Excel. Let's see if I can find it. Because so this is your competition basically. This is like when someone who is not necessarily they're like more like a business analyst. They'll come by and they'll do this like, same analysis in a, in Excel, and you'll see it's you know a different type of messiness. So you, you can produce basically the same analysis. So again, I'm I'm documenting my assumptions, and then I'm having my calendar of days here, and then I put in my parameters and my formulas. I plug those in, and I can make the exact same plots. Right. So it's not to say that you need to work in Jupyter to do numerical modeling. It's not, right? Often it's done in Excel. But uh, it's a question of like whether you think this is easier to read versus the Python model. And my personal preference is Python more readable, usually, if you do it right. So that's just to say you, you can do the exact same modeling in Excel, but uh, this gets, so the Question? Yeah, I, and I was going to say that another source of problems typically in Excel, like I've only done um, basically the, the initial cases of having workers that are trained versus not trained workers. Um, so the, the, the description I've heard that sort of sticks in my mind is that Excel models get more brittle 
as you make them more complicated. Okay, so they're more likely to break. You'll introduce mistakes. Right? Like if you want to do really complicated multi-situation analysis in Excel with like 10 sheets of data, like it gets hard to navigate. Right? So it gets more brutal the more complicated model you have. Now I think that that's it. All right, we'll go back here. Um, yeah, so now it's break time. We'll take a break until 8.10. I saw all the week's stuff now posted up there, um, uh, like the course notebooks and everything. Yes. For some reason, I viewed it once and only had like the last four weeks on it. Okay. But now I guess it's all up. That's good. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, I have multiple working issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if all we're doing is ethics, and do I need to, I don't want to be able to do it. Do you have to participate? Yeah. Is that your question? Yeah. So there, there are activities during the, are you saying you're going to be here? Uh, or yeah, I'm going to either be here or do it on my own. That's up to you, but uh, there are going to be activities for this section.
All right, so I'm going to get started on the ethics and legality. This will be the part that keeps you out of jail. So probably in your interest to pay attention. All right, and again, I'm not an ethics ex I'm not an ethics expert, but I have run into some sticky situations. So um, if anyone has, huh? If I can. <laughs> if anyone has any war stories they want to tell about sticky situations, you're more than welcome to. Uh, this is a discussion hopefully more than a lecture, but, and so what I'm hoping is that you'll be able to express your values in a way that's not too confrontational, but allows you to stick to your principles. Um, and what that really means is not only talking, but listening in a way that other people feel understood. And that's, that's different than just hearing the words someone said. Um, that's not a skill I'm teaching in this class. <laughs> uh, and so, once you hear someone and understand them, it allows you to better respond to their needs and, and sort of empower your actions. So that's sort of the value in doing that. Uh, I can't force you to make ethical decisions, but I can say that our legal system is the way that policies are typically enforced. All right, so the first question for you is, how do you respond when there's disagreement? Because the relevance here of this question is that not everyone shares your principles. Not everyone thinks that what you're doing is right. You won't think that everyone is doing the right thing. So a question on your silver paper is, what do you do when you disagree? And there's a couple of different prompts here. I'm not collecting this paper. 
you won't be sharing this. So my, my motive here is to force you to introspect on paper. That's all of it. We'll take a two minutes and we'll do that little activity. If you need a pen or paper, let me know I'm off and wrong. Paper, pen. Yeah. Paper. All right, so I'll give a little context for why I think this activity, which is not going to be shared, it's not social, why is it of value? Um, it's a lesson that I learned from a good friend of mine who spent many years in jail. Um, <laughs> and so the lesson that I learned from him was that if you think ahead about the situations you're going to face, then you're more at risk to do something rash in the moment where you're stressed. So if you're facing a situation where there's a significant need for immediate action and you've never thought about the problem before, you will do in the moment what you think is right. That's not a problem. The problem is, in retrospect, that maybe wasn't the right choice. So thinking under pressure is very hard. My solution is think about the problem you're going to face before you're faced with that stressful situation. So if you can think ahead about, you know, I'm going to go to this meeting today. It's going to be stressful. Before I get to the meeting and, and our stress, I will think about different ways I can process that in environment and, and the options before me, rather than getting to the meeting, being stressed, and then yelling at someone. Right In the moment, yelling at someone in a meeting may, find, may feel sort of cathartic. Right? It may feel like it's a good thing to do. But then in retrospect, you're fired or suspended, and maybe it wasn't a good decision. Right? So thinking ahead about stressful situations, and what you're going to do in those, what the options are, what are the, you know, the conditional uh, situations, that helps you make a better decision. So, and you will run into people you disagree with. You're, I guarantee, right? That, I guarantee very few things. But if you do work with people, which I hope you will as data scientists, you'll run into this problem. And you'll be stressed out because that person's not behaving the way that you think they should. And you're going to have to figure out how to process that because they're not going away magically. Okay. There is an entire course on this very subject. I'm not teaching it. It's uh, Adam Lip. Has anyone here taken or is taking that course? Awesome. All right. So I coordinated with him uh, last semester. I didn't uh, get a response from him this semester, but uh, there is a course on that. So maybe you guys, if you're taking this course, can you validate? Like, is this a true fact? Like, are you reading about Cambridge Analytica and Google? Is that a thing? Are you reading about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and yourself? So? Okay. So, so that is um, currently in practice. Uh, yeah. All right. So, and getting back to the sort of money thing, there is actually money in thinking about ethics for data science. Um, there was recent, relatively recently, a, a half million dollar grant to figure out how to 
consider these things. The reason that the National Science Foundation needs help with this problem is because as a community of data scientists, we typically adhere to norms established by our community. Um, but that actually takes explicit intentional work to establish what the norms should be. And it's complicated because data science is really diverse, right? There's a lot of different situations you'll find yourself in. So the challenge is what's the commonality that we should agree to, even though we're each working on little different unique problems, right? It can't be the case that every unique problem requires unique ethical principles to stick to, right? Like there is commonality. So figuring out what that is is important. Okay, so I'm gonna just go right to the takeaways. Like if you drop out of the rest of this lecture and fall asleep, I'm cool because this section is me telling you what I think you should worry about. The thing I just described and had you do the exercise on, I call that pre-caching. So like before you even get into the stressful situation, think about how you're gonna handle it because under that stressful condition, you will not be as functional as you'd like. You will make decisions and they'll more likely to be wrong. Okay. Um, if you work with other people, they won't share your values or your principles, so therefore their behavior won't be what you expect. Um, and so there's two solutions to that, right? Just like have anarchy, have everybody run around and do their own thing. That's one solution. I've seen it in practice. It's not cool. Another solution right, is to have everybody sort of bent to the same like paradigm and like perspective on what the right thing to do is. That's a lot of work. So typically it's not done. And so there's this mixture of a level of anarchy mixtured with uh, you know some policy enforcement. How that takes form in each organization is different. Um, but right, you have to either you have to like tell people that there's a policy, enforce the policy, and then when they violate it, punish them. Right? That's like the typical cycle of, of this idea. So <laughs> One of my little bend and quirks is I figure out what the policies are so that I can violate them effectively. <laughs> what I mean by that is if everyone adheres to the same policy and does the same thing, they're going to get the same results. Right? So how do you as a data scientist stand out? You make sure that what you're doing is legal um, and doesn't violate the law in the strict sense, right? but allows you to do things that maybe other people thought wasn't reasonable. All right, so why did the policy exist in the first place? What caused that policy to be triggered? What, what are the enforcement mechanisms? What are the punishments if I violate it, right? If I know all those things, my calculus of what actions I can take is probably different than the people who are just like cowering in the corner, not sure when the lawyers are gonna show up. Right, so being informed about the policies allows you to be more agile and informed about the decisions you're making. It's not a game for everyone, right? It's a higher risk tolerance because you're skirting what people think is normal. Okay, this is <laughs> my plea to you. You are the data scientist. You will be in charge of aggregating significant amounts of data that is probably gonna be um, you know, highly financially important, expose a lot of people to a lot of risk that they're not in charge of, and so you'll be the responsible party. So <laughs> my, my hope is that when you walk away, you have that in mind of, it's not just a CSV, it's every healthcare record of every patient in Maryland, right? It, it is a CSV, but it's not just a CSV. Right? So the, hopefully your sense of responsibility is proportional to the sensitivity of the data you're working on. All right, and I think my last takeaway is that I didn't know that was illegal is not a defense. So you're responsible for knowing what the arena you're playing in is, right? Um, and I'm not a legal uh, person, so you can't use it against me. Wait, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I have some examples to make this more specific, but basically for any domain that you're in, you'll have to learn the local laws for that domain, and they're gonna be different. Okay. So back to the idea, <laughs> now we're into like this, the deeper sort of perspective on those major takeaways. Um, so the, the first one is that you'll be working on data that's probably sensitive. Whether, and I don't know what the source of that data will be, but if it weren't important, you wouldn't be working on it. So there's a correlation there, right? You're gonna work on stuff that's important, hopefully. And usually the people who are being analyzed, they don't get a choice, right? When you went to the hospital and got your you know broken tooth fixed, you didn't um, actually consent to the idea in your mind Right, maybe you wrote your signature on a piece of paper, 
but you're not thinking that, oh yeah, I've been aggregated with every other patient in this hospital record database and sold for 50 cents a record, right? That's probably not what you were thinking. You just got your tooth fixed. And so as a data scientist, you're responsible for the aggregate of all those individual private information, typically. Okay. So not everyone sort of adheres to this norm. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's even a wiki page for a news article, which I think is unusual, but um, this is a, a widely heard back in 2015, and then like you know, had some congressional hearings and things. And so like this idea of safeguarding other people's privacy, that was Facebook's responsibility. They let it go in the interest of making money. And so that was a trade-off, John. Something about this case, which is not in the class, but yeah. it makes sense. Like, I think there's there's also you make this point with like if you ever seen that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, it's like catching a can. Like just because something is it, like a, that's just an example, but just because something's not specifically illegal, then that's where like the ethics come in. Because yeah. like, could this become illegal later because I did it? <laughs> yeah, this is like rules are made because of people like me. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, like like this wasn't specifically illegal, but now we've been like the Congress and like all this like crazy mess. I don't know if you looked at the news recently, so yeah. And I, and again, this goes back to the trade off of like you know a large company could put policies in for in place to prevent this type of behavior, even though it's not illegal. And it's a question that comes down to the end of like, are they going to make more money with that policy in place or not? And that's the business calculus of whether they should act on it. So in a business sense, it's not that ethical, but in the individual persons right, who are implementing the policy, they have to think about that. All right. And this goes back to the sort of same concept, different domain, um, where like who here has heard of the dating website, OkCupid? Got a few people. Okay. So there is a dating website called OkCupid okay where if you're looking for love in all the wrong places, you go to the internet and then sign up with a profile and you usually post your picture and some personal details in order to entice people to your attractiveness so that they talk to you. That's a dating website. So there's a dating website where there's lots of profiles. And so um, these Danish researchers, just to sort of like prove a point, went off and gathered all that data, right, for 70,000 people and then posted it to the internet, which you know, it's cool that technically you can do that, um, but that's probably not what the people who signed up for the website were looking for in the first place when they signed up. So it's a question of like, you know, OkCupid's business model was sort of predicated on the idea that individuals will find other individuals using algorithms, not they'll dump all the data for the website. So, so I think. No, 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 it wasn't a hack. It's just they scraped the entire website. Right. So these are the tools you have access to. Yeah. Right. Basically, you can pretend your web browser is an individual and just automate it to go through all the profiles. Right. Is that the right thing to do from the researcher's perspective? They thought they were proving a point, right? but that's not what the individual signing up for the site thought. Okay. So as I'm trying to emphasize here, <laughs> you will be responsible for lots of data. And that means, like, if I'm walking around with a laptop and the laptop goes missing, that's on you, right? You're the data scientist who owns that data and is responsible for its security. The fact that it's lost, you know, someone else has the laptop, that's cool. Actually, it has all the data on it, too. That's not cool. So this is sort of like, why do we think about security? Um, that's why. OK, so now we have an activity. So half the class is going to get one piece of paper, and the other half the class is going to get the other half. So you're going to get the same. Not quite going to work half of the ball first. I'm going to pick one of the YouTube, but I don't know. So we're not going to be numbering here. So, 
here and do one, two, then three, then four, five, six, seven, eight, one, and a two, go up three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so you have each pieces of paper that has a role describing your function in life. You're employed, you should be happy. All right. Once you've read that over, we're going to pair up with the other person who has your number. And then we're going to have a discussion. So, pair up with your number. We have numbers. Who is eight? Eight. Eight. Three. Six. Three. Thank you. 
All right, you can come back to your seats. All right, so in this exercise, there there is not, as usual, a correct answer to the outcome. Right? It's basically there was an action, and the activity was to understand your interaction with that action. Like, how did you process it? Right? Going back to the first exercise we did for this ex section was, how do you process conflict? Right? That's the underlying question. All right. So. <laughs> The ways that I, I've observed lots of conflict, like that's just the nature of the work that I do. And so the ways that I've seen people respond to it is sometimes healthy and sometimes not healthy, more often the not healthy section. Um, so typically when so observing behavior that's malicious or just ignorant or bad, right, whatever you want to characterize it, the normal response is to ignore it with different sort of like nuances of Ignore it and right, it goes away, or ignore it that someone else takes on that problem, or hope that it doesn't actually matter. Right. So, that, um, but I've never seen the ignoring actually be effective. Right. The ignoring is basically kicking the can down the road, hoping someone else will step up to the plate, which isn't you, um, and and hopefully that you're not involved. And I've never seen that be successful. Right. All it really does is force someone else to do the work that I think you should be doing. Right? Like you're an adult, you have the ability to communicate, you have a technical basis for making statements, right? Those are activities that, um, as an adult, I think you could do. So there's lots of like ways to confront people in a gentle, kind way. I'm maybe not going to dive too deep into that, but um, basically it comes down to the ability to understand where you're coming from, understand where they're coming from, and look for that opportunity to collaborate. All right, a bit of a context change. <laughs> the thing that I mentioned earlier about like you're responsible for the data, you're responsible typically for your security. And although I haven't touched on it at all in this class, um, it's highly, like unless you're working in some gigantic organization that enforces IT policies upon you, in a small company, you're going to be responsible for making sure that the data is secure. So that typically means encrypt it. Um, and monitoring the access to the data so that only the right people have access to it. So, again, not part of this class, but IT security is something that it won't be unusual if it's fostered upon you, right? The business person is going to see you as, oh, you're the data scientist. You know computers. Therefore, we'll make you the security person for computers. And it's a natural, logical leap that lots of people will make. So they had to. No? Zach? It's more money. <laughs> so, so ideally, if they're fostering additional roles upon you for which you are ill-qualified, you'll either say no or I need the certifications and class training to go with that. Maybe that results in money, maybe it doesn't, but um, very rarely have I seen someone say, oh, here's extra roles and duties and the money that goes with the responsibility. I, I don't think I've seen that <laughs> ever. <laughs> okay. So. Um, the thing that I would argue, the encryption part is relatively, right? Are you using HTTPS for transferring data? Are you storing it encrypted? Those are really easy things to measure. The harder things to measure is the logging of who had access, when did they access it, what did they do? Right, that means more than just like version control. That means like monitoring, looking at the data, and, and what they're doing with it. So that's a way harder problem. Um, and you will spend a lot of effort if that becomes important in your job. As I mentioned earlier, um, there's also some legal motivation for you to do the right thing. Right? This is the way that the community enforces its policy through the legal system. They make laws, and then they have police enforce them and whoever else. So example of that, if you're operating in California or Europe, they have some policies that you'll need to follow for privacy. And then there's sort of like domain-specific constraints like HIPAA um, and other issues where like you have to make sure that you're handling the data in the right way for that domain. So I, I won't be covering those, but typically, if you enter into an industry, you'll be way uh, aware of them. You'll be made aware of them because everyone will be forced to do that work at the same time. So 
The nice thing about laws is that as long as everybody is following them, they're all incurring the same cost, so it doesn't hopefully change the competitiveness at a given scale too much. Okay. Um, along with the security and legal part, one way that you can sort of like address that is by not working with private data. So this is the earlier you can anonymize and, and like make the data less sensitive, the better. So that typically there's like like two options, right? On ingest and on reporting. So if you're doing transformations to the data that depend on knowing the person's address and social security number and name, then you won't be able to do the anonymization on ingest. But typically you don't have to have all those fields of data. Right? Unless you're doing some really weird stuff. You can typically remove or anonymize the fields you don't care about right, as much, and then you can operate more safely with less risk. All right, so let's get into an example of what that actually carries out to. Mm, right. So even with anonymization, you can sometimes reverse engineer who is what. So an example of that, um, I'll read through this a little bit, but Basically, a large organization released some data that was claimed to be anonymized. It had removed all the sensitive information about every hospital visit. This sounds like an interesting problem, right? If we can figure out who's doing what, we can uh, tie specific um, people to their actions. So they did the right thing, right? In terms of like name, address, social security number, those are the things that we typically consider private. And so there was a person um, who knew some specific details that wasn't in the original data set. And those additional correlating details were sufficient to de-anonymize the data. So even though they had removed all the important stuff from their perspective in that data set, combining data sets, right, which should sound familiar, it's your final project. <laughs> and, um, so she was able to figure out um, who was doing what, right, specifically for that person that de-anonymize the data by combining data sets. Um, so the specific actions are, I think she's still a privacy researcher that's active. This is a pretty widely known story. Um, and so this was a significant embarrassment of uh, not anonymizing data properly. Okay. So, all right. So another aspect to, to, to worry about is that your data, like your attendance at UMBC, right, the fact that you visited the hospital, your insurance claims, right, the fact that you've paid bills, all that sort of information, and the internet, obviously, all that information about you is being sold right now. Like it's a, it's a transaction that's happening as we speak. And right? it's constantly in flux, movement across differences, trying to figure out who their next customer is going to be, who, how are you voting. All these things motivate people to, to find private information and sell it. So that's you. You'll be the buyer and seller of this data. And, uh, I don't know how to process that because I don't have experience with it, but a little scary for me. Right. And then uh, just to think about the data, the um, has anyone heard of the story about target and pregnancies? It's like one, two. OK, so the story here is. There was a company named Target, or Targe, Targe, I guess, <laughs> who um, wanted to advertise to consumers. And they wanted to do it in a personalized manner. So they figured out um, if people are pregnant, then they're probably going to want to buy um, baby related things, right? Like nooks and pacifier, or pacifiers and balls and blankets and everything else goes with babies, right? And if you knew you're going to have a baby, which most people do at the time they're going to have a baby. They would buy things in advance. And so you want to advertise to that demographic, right? The people who are pregnant, buy, sell, advertise them the, uh, the baby related stuff. Sounds reasonable. Problem is, so if Target figures out that you're pregnant and they start sending you advertising and you didn't want anyone to know that, right? maybe you're living at home with your parents and you're a young teenager in high school, and you don't want people to know that you're pregnant, right? that's a bit of an issue. So um, that's what happened to Target is they did this very personalized advertising campaign. And uh, a person's parent, um, a kid's parents, found out that they were pregnant and was not very happy and got Target in a bunch of trouble. So, so targeted advertising sounds great unless it has some ramifications, which are unexpected, and it didn't look too good for Target. 
So you can read about that if you want. Uh, another sort of danger of, of advertising your services rather than a product is that um, there are people who have artificial intelligence companies, which are actually a bunch of people doing the work. So can I want to explain why that would happen? Why would you advertise an AI company and actually have people doing the work? All right. So the way that AI works is typically if you're working on a supervised uh, learning problem where you have labeled data and unlabeled data, then you can build machine learning models branded as artificial intelligence, and you get a bunch of people who want to invest money in your corporation. Right? That's the normal life cycle for um, a machine learning based company. The problem is, how do you start out with no data? So you have to build up this data set right, about customer behaviors or advertising patterns or whatever. How do you get that labeled data? Well, the behind the scenes secret is that a lot of companies will um, hire a bunch of people to do a bunch of manual labor to create the data. Right? So like, let's say I'm working at a telecom, I don't know, uh, a call-in center. Right? And I'm trying to do machine learning on the voice recognition of that call-in center. And it's a very reasonable problem in some sense. Audio processing, we don't do that. We can do text analysis. Right? And so you could be a company trying to sell an artificial intelligence product for that call-in center. But what you're really doing is you have a bunch of people decoding all those uh, phone calls and writing them into text. And right? so you're not actually using machine learning. Is it an ethical thing to do? That's uh, Right, it's a it's a trade off of well, I'm only going to do the manual portion of the processing for a little while before we get this data set labeled and it can do it at a larger scale. So it's a moral trade off, right? Of like you're somewhat lying to company, you're lying to people that you're not actually an artificial intelligence company. You're an organization with a bunch of people decoding audio transcripts. So that's um, an example of problems where like it's a little bit of a gray area. Like you wouldn't ever advertise, hey, we write a bunch of people and we're gonna advertise it as artificial intelligence. That's doesn't sound right. But that's what people do. Okay. So a slightly different discussion um, that we're gonna transition to is how do you work with people who aren't like you? All right. So we're gonna count off. Please. Mm -hmm. well, we'll hold that for discussion. One. Uh, I think we're going up to eight. Seven, eight, eight. One, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it'll be okay. Okay. So, question for you is how do you solve this problem? You have to actually move out of your desk. Seven? Is there an eight? Seven? Seven? I'm 
enough to internalize wanting to improve or whether they're going to be someone you have to babysit. Yeah. Like maybe they're just not aware that they're not producing as many widgets as everybody else. Right? That's, that's a communication issue on your part. So you fail. Right? So telling people that, hey, this is what the expected standards are. This is where you are. Makes it very clear what the game is.
So a lot of workplaces deal with this issue by having like, uh, you know, monthly or quarterly or annual sort of review sessions so that everybody is intentionally advertised that this is where your performance is with respect to everybody else and where we want it to be. That's a typical good business practice in terms of like being explicit about their expectations. Has anyone here dealt with coworkers who have different objectives than you? Yeah, Zach? I mean, yeah. What did you do with that? Well, um, and this is something we talked about this yeah, but um, we kind of like all sit down and talk about um, kind of like prioritize the goals, okay. so to speak. Um, and then for your, I mean, there's bound to be some like common ground. So find commonality? Yeah, and then from there you can kind of out a path that helps everyone, you know, reach those goals. Okay, so establish, so find commonality and then establish shared goals. Okay. Dana, you have something? Same thing. Um, just kind of talk it out with different perspectives, bring different ideas. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say communicate? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, going back, communicate. Like, again, the most often thing that I see is avoidance, right? You recognize there's a problem and then you try to ignore it. So, communicating is totally a solution. Yeah. Um, something which is like more of a soft thing, but the, I had a project I was working on with someone else. It wasn't, we were working towards the same goal, but it, the reason it wasn't getting through was because we, our work style was completely different. So, mm -hmm. like, it was affecting pushing out the end result. Right. How did you resolve that? If, if. Um, basically, like, I was attempting to, like, push forward and, like, I don't, like, I don't know if bypass is the right word, mm -hmm. but instead of just trying to, like, seek their approval, I got their, like, I allowed them to have more input on the final result and then they kind of they actually went through the collaboration effort instead of trying to like push through that barrier. So you saw some, some collaboration. Yeah, yeah, like more so than I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> so you worked out of your comfort zone. Yes. Okay. Good. Anybody else have any experience you want to share? And then the last one, um, I was advertising with my partner that I'm typically considered the cheater because I try to figure out what the social norms are so that I can figure out what is the consequence of violating those social norms so I can figure out whether I want to do that or not. So that's a very intentional choice on my part. Um, and the reason I do that is this last part of like, I can do things other people think are unreasonable or undoable. And that's that's the reason, that's my motive. Okay, I think it's time for a break. Yeah, so we've got, well, before we get to the break, you said some other things that I've heard. So. One thing that um, underperforming things, you should typically escalate that to your supervisor after talking maybe to the coworker or maybe to the supervisor first. That's like a personal preference choice of how competition would be. Um, thing is, is this underperformance a recurring issue? Dan mentioned that if it's going on for two years, it's definitely a recurring issue. Um, yeah, training and then figure out what's going on. And yeah, I think we've got everything else. Okay. Time for a break. So come back at nine. Was that nine twelve to nine twelve? Not a marker. Oh yeah, I'll take those. Thanks. Do
question that I hate it so much. Maybe he is going forward. I think about once in my life. I have a thing about thinking ahead numbers. Those are things that people don't like to get back to the process. So, ah, I'm not going to stop. You agree? Yeah, I'm going to stop. 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 I'm going
right? And so like when you're going off and finding allies, it has to be with some clear benefit to them and your needs. And that's the hard part, I would argue, of data science is it's not just whipping up Python notebooks. It's a lot of allegiance building, alliance building, and, and trying to figure out why are people going to work with me, right? To solve the technical problems, right? In the end, hopefully, you're here to solve technical problems. I, I think that's what the training is for. The, all the other stuff, the 95% of your work is the non technical part. Right. So, everyone should have a half sheet of paper. My activity for you is in this course, for the next session of Data 601 students, what is your advice to them? So this is something that you will turn in. I'm not looking for your name on the paper. Um, and this is hopefully I'm seeking constructive advice. Things like, you know, listen to Ben, he's a great guy. I, I can't tell students that. It's not gonna help. Thank <laughs> you. 